Right, I'm just checking whether everything is on. Uh, I just need to turn the audio off here. Okay. Uh, right, we should be live now. Um, me thinks. I'm just checking, everything is on. Yeah, it looks good so far. So no drop frames, which means um, internet connection is up to scratch. Uh, okay, I can see on the other computer everything is coming up. Uh, right, who have you got? Hi, Charlie. Uh, <clears throat> Callum, hi. Uh, please uh, just announce yourself once you come in, uh, and then uh, we'll make a start in two minutes. Is the audio loud enough? I'm just checking. Yeah, it should be okay. I think. Okay, we've got 11 people, should should be a few more to come. Um, hi, Callum, uh, welcome. What are we waiting for? Uh, some Joe, Joe, is Joe with you, Amy? Or uh, do you know whether he's uh, listening? Let's put the microphone a bit closer. Okay, what's the time? We've got two o'clock, 11 people, a few more to come. Okay, Declan, hi, Declan. Okay, um, right, anyway, we are going to make a start. Um, so this is part two. Um, so we're looking at three-phase motors. One more part to come after this. And um, and then we are we are pretty much done with the unit. We've covered everything or at least, you know, did some repetition. Uh, hi, Declan. Hi, Georgie. Uh, 14 people. Okay, we should be about there. Uh, I think a couple, couple, couple of you are missing. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm sure um, we'll catch up later. Um, again, please, if you're here and um, you haven't... Um, just a moment. Let me just uh, turn this down. Hopefully, I'm not going to close this down. Okay. <clears throat> uh, just in case um, you're on, uh, please just uh, say hi or something, just so I can see your name pop up uh, for the register. So that's uh, that's what I need. Right. Okay. Let's make a start. So last, not last presentation, but one before the last, and then we've still got the assignment to go through. Um, so um, uh, try and if you've got any questions, feel free to, you know, just butt in and uh, write your question down, and I'll try and answer it as we as we go through. So it's it's just really a catch up session of what we've done before, and, and that's that's all it all it is really. Okay, um, after the lesson you will know. So really, we're starting with one point five. So slight mistake there. Uh, so it's one point six. State the application of three phase AC machines. 1.7 calculate calculate values of voltage and current in configured systems. The 1.8 determine the neutral current in a three phase and neutral supply. Uh, 1.9 calculate the characteristics of three phase motors. Yeah. So we we're going to look at at these aspects. Um, characteristics is a little bit about single pole, double pole, triple pole, and so on, and uh, what you would get for torque and um, and all the other bits. We're not going to um, go too deep into it. We are not, not required to, but uh, just sort of touch the, um, the basic aspects of three-phase motors. Uh, hi, Alex. Who, who else have we got? Hayden. Hi. And uh, Georgie as well. Hi. So good to see you on. Um, how many people? 14. Okay. Uh, 14. Good. Okay, let's move on. Um, so the first thing we need to look at is uh, three-phase current. Yeah. 
and uh, I, I'm sure you have seen this graphic before. Um, we've got three phases. Uh, the phases are sometimes referred to as L1, L2, and L3. L stands for life, so it's life one, life two, life three. There are a couple of things, and just follow the mouse, which you uh, need to sort of understand when you look at this diagram. The first one is we've got zero volts here, and we've got a, the peak voltage here. So the peak voltage would typically be about uh, 339 volts. Uh, where's the mouse? Here's the mouse. So that's the peak voltage of phase one. So 339 volts, that's a peak voltage. So when we take the RMS voltage, so we take 339, we multiply it by 0 0.707, so that's uh, the square root of 2 over 1, and um, we get 240 volts. Yeah. So that's where our 240 volts RMS comes from. So that, that stands for root mean square. So hopefully this jogs a little bit of memory if you... Uh, if you haven't done this before. So we get an average value of about 240 volts with respect to the zero volt line here. Okay, now all these three phases, they are connected together. And what we find is that, um, um, <clears throat> again, try and follow the mouse. When you look at this phase here, and you go all the way down here, so that phase with respect to either phase two or phase three um, has got, a, a, you can work it out. So it's, uh, let me just do this on here, uh, so we get our figures correctly. So all we need to do, let's, uh, can I do it on the other computer? I'm going to do it on my second computer. So I'm going to call up the calculator, and uh, so we know that the three-phase voltage is 415. That's what's bundled about all the time. So we multiply it by 1.41, um, and we get um, 585 volts. Yeah? So the voltage between that point here if you look at the mouse and that point here where where we've got phase two and phase three um the voltage difference is uh i just said it i cl clicked it down is 585 volts you know based on a 240 volt system and you know doing the calculations around there so it's near enough 600 volts with all the tolerances and everything that's in there okay so that's the and again if you take the rms value from that yeah, so uh, we get 415 volts. Yeah, so that's the the average value. Right. Okay. Um, so where would the current flow if you've got a neutral wire here? And that's important as well. So just going to anticipate some stuff. So if you've got a neut neutral wire, so the neutral wire has got a value of uh, zero volts, and here we've got a value of minus um, minus what? Uh, <laughs> minus. Um, um, 558 minus, I, I can do this on a calculator, can't I? Let me just do this. So it's minus 415 and uh, we get 170 volts. Yeah? So we've got like a 170 volts going down here. Um, <clears throat> round about there, yeah, roughly. So the answer is obvious. So whatever current you have, it wouldn't flow into the neutral wire, but it would flow into the uh, into the um, the, the wire, which has got a, a far more negative voltage, so the neutral wire normally would not carry any current at all. So that means when we've got a three-phase system, just based on, <clears throat> on this diagram, we can make a, um, a, a, a safe statement to say that uh, in the neutral wire, which would be set at zero volts, we don't have any current flow, okay? But the current would flow into the wires of phase two and phase three when phase one is at a peak. And obviously the same happens at phase two and just look at phase two here so we've got phase two and uh, we've got uh, phase one and phase three uh, at this minus voltage here and we've got the neutral wire obviously at zero volts and so all the current would just go would just flow right down into phase one and phase three so we wouldn't get any current into uh, into the neutral wire Okay, that's really something I, I want to get across with this diagram. The other one is, and this is sort of a standard question, when you've got a three-phase current, so we've got our 360 degrees uh, dealt with. Okay, um, I think that's the, uh, the main thing I wanted to get across here. Uh, we can move on. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, we've got a three-phase generator, and again, we are looking at three-phase machines. And uh, and that's pretty much what we find in power plants. Yeah? So if you go to uh, if you, if uh, some of you are local here, so you know Ferrybridge Power Station, which has been mothballed. But if you go to Gould, 
and you've got drugs power station over there if you go there and you were to look inside and and, and and pretty much all power stations even if it's a nuclear power station eventually it goes down to uh, to uh, to that system here that you've got like a massive generator you <clears throat> you um, you energize the rotor with um, with DC so you put some electricity in the rotor and as that thing spins round um, power is induced into the coils which go all the way around it and you get your three phase current uh, again the whole idea is you you buy one um, get three free so you've got one generator and because you've got these this array of coils you generate a, a three phase current which is offset you know as that thing spins round by um, by 120 degrees uh, we know that it spins around at 50 50 times per second yeah. And it's interesting as well. So when you look at power stations and when, the, when you look at the national grid, so the national grid puts a load on these generators, so thousands of generators in Europe which produce the electricity, and, uh, and the load is sort of pulled on at the same time. And what you find is that, um, that uh, when the load is too big, um, this generator is going to slow down. And it goes from 50 revolutions per minute down to maybe 49 revolutions per minute. And that's uh, what they're looking out for. So if the frequency, because uh, the load on the grid is too, too heavy, if the frequency slows down, uh, then they know they need to put more power stations online to try and deal with the, um, um, the load they have in the country. And the, 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 um, the example which is always used when um, um, the good old days when we only had three teleprograms or three channels, uh, or four channels, channel four as well, and um, <clears throat> Coronation Street was on and the advertising break was on. And the whole nation watched Co Coronation Street or EastEnders or something. And then suddenly um, advertising kicked in and um, uh, everybody went out to have a cup of tea. So millions of kettles were turned on up and down the country and the load would come in straight away. And then uh, they sometimes would have to kick in a few more generators or a few more power stations to deal with the demand, uh, otherwise the frequency would slow down and that's a big no-no on the grid. Uh, right, uh, next slide. Uh, squirrel cage induction motor. So we talked about, um, when we looked at the single <clears throat> single phase motor, we talked about the squirrel cage. And you can see this here. So all it means is you've got a, a ring there and you've got a ring on this side and you've got some um, wires which connect both rings together. And uh, what, what happens is when that thing spins round, um, um, like, right, let me, let me start again. When we get an, an electromagnetic field, you know, based on three-phase current, which is just sort of follow the mouse, just orbiting all the way around, just going in a circle all the way around, spinning around, um, there's a current induced into the squirrel cage, and the squirrel cage will, uh, in turn, you know, push the current through these uh, lines here from one side to the other and in turn generate a magnetic field. Yeah? So you've got two magnetic fields, they both interact and they, they start spinning that thing around, yeah? spinning the rotor around. And so we've got this huge advantage where we've got a rotor that has got no electrical connection whatsoever um, and uh, we have got um, um, coils or windings uh, which again have got no contacts, there's no centrifugal switch, there's nothing at all, and um, and you've got this, the, the motor spinning around. The the only force which is used here is is induction. You know, the, the rotor is spinning around by the force of induction. That motor is called an asynchronous motor, and um, and and the beauty is there's no sparks, no arcs, there's very little maintenance, there are no slip rings, there are no, no uh, carbon brushes which eventually wear down and need replacing so if you've got a motor and if all you have is you know as far as wear and tear is concerned is a is a bunch of bearings and if they are well greased they will last for a very very long time so um, almost a, an indestructible motor um, the beauty is they're cheap um, they're easy to manufacture um, they are very durable they are very low maintenance and they are um, idea for industry. 
Um, right, Brett. We're going to come to the uh, to the polls in a minute. So uh, so please bear bear with me. Um, I'm just looking at the the questions. The answer is yes, uh, but uh, we'll we'll go through that in a minute. Right. So that's a square cage induction motor, and it's a so-called asynchronous motor. If you remember from um, the, the sessions we did in in the past, asynchronous motors are self starters. Just to remind you. Um, they, there's a little bit of slip. You've got your design frequency, which would be 3,000 RPM, but they never make it to 3,000 RPM. Um, by the principle, by the working principle, they'll only go close to it. They get near it, but um, but they're never gonna gonna hit um, uh, 3,000 um, 3,000 RPM. They might hit 2,900 or 2,950, but there's always a little bit of slip slip behind it, and it's just the way they work. Synchronous motor, different story. They are not self-starters, so they need some help in starting, and um, they um, they um, uh, they actually run at synchronous speed. Uh, so once they lock into synch synch uh, synchronism, they they will just run at the whatever speed, whatever frequency is, is supplied to the uh, to the windings. Okay. Uh, just a summary, so we've got a squirrel cage induction motor, it's purely inductive. There are no slip rings, it's not commutator. And then this is a biggie, you know, they're intrinsically safe. There's no sparks and no fire, no risk of fire, or very little risk of fire, obviously. If the insulation breaks down or something else happens, uh, there's uh, a risk of, a very small risk of sparks, but um, general operation, when, when they are operating in normal conditions, there are no sparks generated whatsoever. Uh, it's an asynchronous motor, so there's a little bit of slip, and and they slip behind design speed. They are self-starters. Uh, it's good as well, but always bear in mind when we talk about starting three-phase motors, um, they are there's a, a, a huge current in rush as they as they are starting. So um, um, so sometimes that's a problem. We need to deal with this sudden current in rush yeah, to make sure that uh, that they are um, they are okay. Um, right, um, what else do we have? Fixed speed to turn the frequency of supply. Three coils, okay, for a single pole motor. And uh, Brett, here we, we are coming up with the uh, single pole and double pole and triple pole and so on. So when we, when we talk about a single pole motor, it talks about pole pairs. Yeah? Let me just go back. Can we see this? Uh, not in this diagram. Yeah, we can see this at the generator here. So we've got... Um, one phase, that's a red one, then we've got another phase, which is a yellow one, and then phase number three, which is a blue one. So this will be considered to be a pole pair. Yeah? Um, and then that's considered to be a pole pair as well, and the blue one is a pole pair as well. So we're going to delve into this a little bit more. Okay, next one is um, the wound rotor motor. Yeah? That's a mouthful of that, wound rotor motor. It's synchronous, okay? And again, just have a look at the diagram down here. Um, you've got all the, the poles. Yeah? So in this instance, we have got... Uh, they're not 100% lined up, are they? Uh, yeah, these are the, the different poles. And so they are the, the stator windings. Again, stator is the stuff on the outside, which doesn't move, and armature is the stuff on the inside on the rotor, which actually does move, yeah? Right, so we've got the rotor, and you see on the rotor, you've got your windings here. Yeah? So the windings are done. And then you've got windings on the uh, outside here, yeah? on the, in the stator. And then you've got slip rings. And the slip rings provide DC current to, um, to, the, to the rotor. Okay, so it gets quite complex. So we've got our three-phase supply, which is AC, normally 50 hertz. And then we've got a DC supply, which is just plus and minus. Um, and um, and so we've got these po these powers coming in, and then straight away you can see you've, you've got your if you take this motor apart and you feed everything in. So you, you would have your L1, L2, and L3 for your wires. Then you would have your plus and minus for your DC, and then you might still have an earth cable and a neutral cable. So you're looking at about five, seven connections for a synchronous motor. Now in real life it's not quite like it. So you you, you normally you know the DC supply is taken from one of the phases, which is rectified and then fed into into the uh, into the rotor, uh, and, and so you don't get you know necessarily 
uh, seven different connections, but there are seven different types of connections or, uh, you know, which have to be made somewhere, either, you know, combined in the motor or um, um, in some, some other fashion. Okay, so the first thing, the first fact is the rotor has got a wound coil. Um, DC is fed into the coil for a static magnetic field. Yeah, so that's generated, static magnetic field. And obviously we know uh, the... On, and, and they produce something like a rotating magnetic field. So that just turns round and round and round. And you can sort of imagine, so it tries to get hold of the uh, static magnetic field and start moving it around. A motor rotates at frequency of supply. So that's very important as well. So it locks in eventually. And once it's locked in, it'll just, just stay at the supply, you know, at the speed determined by the supply frequency. So if you put in 50 hertz, so that's 50 times... Um, uh, 60, which gives us 3,000, and so we've got 3,000 RPM, you know, or 50 revolutions per second, or 3,000 revolutions per minute. Uh, the important thing is it's not a self-starter, so we need to to apply some clever technology to try and uh, get the thing to start. You know. Okay, what is the advantage of a synchronous motor? A synchronous motor has got more torque. Um, there's something where you can manipulate the motor as well, so depending on how much DC you put into the rotor, you can actually um, deal with different types of loads uh, to to move them. So um, you can sort of play about with the uh, the current you you feed into the into the rotor as well. Obviously, you can vary the current you feed into the stator into the stator coils from the three phase supply. So there are a lot of angles where you can manipulate the motor and you can uh, you know use it for high power application. Um, what you find in industry is that um, the stuff you most likely have um, on conveyor belts, sort of small motors, um, they, are, they are predominantly uh, asynchronous motors because they're just easy to, to maintain, virtually zero maintenance. There are no brushes, there's no nothing there. Um, and when they go, you just swap them. They're fairly cheap. And you find if you've got like huge massive motors for, um, I don't know, monster machines, if, if you want to use this expression, for huge machines, um, which have to deal with a humongous amount of loads, uh, they sometimes use um, um, an, a synchronous wound rotor motor um, because there's more power there, they can control it better and... Uh, in a minute, when we look at cars, uh, you, you get a little bit of uh, regenerative uh, power generation as well. So you can produce power with uh, um, with um, with one of with a synchronous motor as well. Yeah. So it can it can work as a generator as well as as a motor. Yeah. So we're going to look at this as well in a minute and discuss this briefly. Okay. You okay with this so far? I'm going to have a little break for a minute or so. Any questions? It's just repetition. We should have covered everything in the class before. You okay with everything? Or let me just type this down. Then. Before we go any further, it's important that you are okay with this. Any questions? Okay. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Ryan. Just to remind you, if, if something is not clear or you've got a question, please don't hesitate to just type it in whilst I'm talking. Um, it's the best way, so when I come to a bit of a break, I can just um, stop and uh, comment on it. Um, it's unfortunately with a delay, but let's see, the only way we can work. Okay, let's move on with um, the next slide. 
um, three-phase motor in star configurations. Yeah. So we've got two types of configurations. One of them is star, uh, one of them is delta. So I've got a question here. What is the likely current flowing into um, a three... Pro? I made a mistake here. Let me just go through it again. What is the likely current flowing into the neutral wire of a three-phase motor? Okay, ignore the A3. What is the likely current flowing into the neutral wire of a three-phase motor rated at one kilowatt uh, and wired in star configuration? The neutral wire is connected to the center of the star. Okay, so you've got the star configuration. What is the current that is flowing uh, into the neutral wire? Uh, right, the question is for you. Okay, we are going through synchronous and asynchronous at the end of the session again. That's okay, that's fine. Okay. Right, question to you. What is happening? Let me just correct this. Oh, I need to have that one. And save and view show. <coughs> did I miss something here? Oh, I did. I missed one slide there. Um, so. <coughs> Okay, uh, I've got one answer, zero by Nick. Um, yeah, this is correct, okay. Um, the, the rule is if, um, <clears throat> um, um, by the way, the star configuration is the only configuration where you can actually attach um, a neutral wire. When we look at delta configuration, uh, there's no way where you can stick the neutral wire in. So um, in a balanced system, it should be zero, zero volts. So unless there is... Um, a disconnect somewhere or there's an imbalance you don't get any current into the neutral wire so uh, again the whole idea is you know when this one is at um, uh, you know peak voltage so that would be uh, with respect to zero three three nine volts up here so this one down here would be at minus 170 volts and that would be at zero volts so the current is going to flow where the minus value is yeah and so it would split up between uh, that phase here and that phase so this will be uh, phase three and phase two. So because both of them will be at minus 170 volts or something. Yeah. So nothing goes into the neutral wire. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, it's just important to, to point this out. There's one uh, criteria point as well about the neutral wire and the roll and current into neutral. And the answer is in a three phase system, normally there shouldn't be any current flowing into neutral at all, yeah, unless there's a problem somewhere. Uh, okay. Um, what is the voltage you would measure from L1 to L2 on a three-phase system? What would you expect to measure from L1 to, to neutral and from L2 to neutral? Okay, just give me uh, some answers on that one. Anybody, so feel free, or all of you, ideally. Um, for which one, the first one or the second one? Come on, guys, a <laughs> few more answers.
What have you got? Let's have a look. Okay, Charlie, brave man. Uh, 240 volts for the first question. Um, I'm not giving the answer yet. Hayden, zero volts. Uh, there's no difference in voltage between them. Brett to uh, 110 volts. Okay. Uh, a few more. A few more. What do you think? Are, the, are Charlie, Hayden and Brett right or are they wrong? Okay. Just waiting for a bit. Okay, we've got an answer from Ryan. 415 across the face. So that will be question one. And uh, 240 face to neutral. Okay. Uh, come on, guys. few more answers. Callum, Amy, Georgie, Declan, what do you think? Corey, I haven't heard anything from you. Big question, Sam, are you here? I haven't uh, seen you on yet. Sam, if you are here, give us an answer. Let us know that you are here. Luke, what do you think? One four fifteen. Okay, Corey, what do you think for the second? Amy two forty volts across L two to L one L one to L two. Okay. Okay, right, okay, I'm uh, going to give you the answer. First of all, I'm going to show you a really fantastic uh, animation, which I missed out on for some strange reason. That is the animation. Yeah. Uh, for a three-phase transmission line. Uh, so, um, yeah. Anyway, I thought it's amazing. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, I think I've shown it to you before when we when we covered this. This is uh, uh, I didn't do it myself. I just uh, took it from the internet. But I thought it's an amazing um, amazing animation. Okay, let's um, go one step back. Okay, let's have a look at um, at uh, phase one and phase two. Yeah? So when when we look at phase one and phase two, uh, so we measure it uh, from phase one to phase two. Um, so what we get is uh, we've got phase two down here at this moment in time. We've got phase one here, and uh, we get a voltage of um, 415 volts RMS. So that's the measuring the average. Okay, so phase one to phase two, or phase three for that reason, is going to be a voltage of uh, 415 volts RMS. Yeah. Um, okay, I think some of you got it right in. Didn't you? 415. Ryan got it right. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question. Let's just go back to the question. Uh, hi, Sam. Good to see you on. Um, so we've got L1 to N and L2 to N. Okay, what will we measure? So we go back to this diagram here, and we've got phase 1 to neutral is 240, and phase 2 to neutral is also 240 and again that's measured in RMS the peak value would be 339 or 340 round about there 
Okay, ähm, right, um, anyway, that's just the, um, uh, the answer for that. It, it's important to get your, your head around it. So when you measure from face to face, um, you'll only, always get a high reading of 415 RMS, even though the reading from each face to earth is only going to be 240 volts yeah. or 230 volts, depending whether you stick to the new standards or the old standards. Okay, um, hope this made you think a little bit. Uh, that, that's the main purpose, is just trying to make you think a bit about this. Okay, the next one is we've got star delta configurations. Yeah? And I wanted to sort of highlight a few things. Let me see whether we've got a better diagram for that. Uh, we don't, okay? We just have to use this one, which is fine. Okay, so when you've got a current, <clears throat> um, what you find is with the star configuration, so your current goes through the first winding, and then you've got two paths to where the current will go down. So because those two are in parallel, and um, <clears throat> and so you only have got like half the uh, the value for this coil here. So again, when you look at this coil here, and you look at the current and the, you know, what's stopping the current, you've got um, uh, the reactance of the coil, and uh, which which is you know how the coil responds to frequency. Uh, we've also got something which is called a back EMF, which is a force that opposes the current, which comes from the rotor turning round, and uh, and then we've got the DC resistance of the coil. So all these three values are there together. And then in addition, you've got whatever resistance you've got in this coil, in parallel with that coil, which which is pretty much the same as what we get in this coil, but uh, because those two effectively are in parallel. So it would just be um, sort of half the value. But uh, what you can see is that um, uh, in this instance here, we've got a, um, uh, a lot more resistance for the current to go through. Yeah. Just something to bear in mind. Now let's have a look at delta configuration. When you look at delta configuration, so our current goes in here, yeah, goes through there, and then um, it goes straight out another phase. Yeah, so we've got one phase here, and there it goes out the other phase. When the current, um, <clears throat> and we've got this phase here. The current goes through here. Yeah. Uh, again, it's just one coil to go through, and then uh, it comes out the other phase. And, uh, and you can see that, in average, the current only has to go through one coil rather than through one and a half, you know, effective resistance, one and a half, coils or you know like goes from there to there and from there through there so there's a lot less in delta configuration where the current has got to go through and that's the reason why um, when we've got a motor configured in delta configuration the current draw is a lot higher yeah, and it's just something you have to bear in the back of your mind delta configuration more current through the coils so that means the coils are going to heat up a lot more but it also means that the motor potentially has got much more torque and um, can deal with a higher load in delta configuration. Um, but um, what do we want? I mean, what I find is that the majority of motors are um, wired up in star configuration and not in delta. Yeah. So um, just something, again, to, to bear in mind. Um, right. OK, so sometimes we want all the torque but then what you have to bear in mind as well so in delta configuration uh, my motor is going to take up a lot more current anyway and in um in uh, in star configuration i've only got about 80 percent of the torque yeah but um um in delta i've got more current flow and um and then when you start the motor you don't really have the back emf to control you know from the rotor to control the um, the um, uh, the current flow or to reduce the current flow a little bit, so uh, what you find is that um, the in starting conditions that and we find that the the current which the inrush current for a very short period of time as the rotor starts turning round is about seven times higher than the current the operating current. Yeah. So for example, if my motor takes about five amps. And um, that means that uh, I would have 35 amps when the motor starts. And there are a couple of problems. One problem is it would throw out fuses. Uh, it would call, cause uh, a lot of problems uh, on, the, um, on the circuit. 
if I don't do anything about this. Yeah. Um, in delta configuration, if my motor takes more current anyway, so for example, it takes um, 7 amps instead of 5 amps, yeah, just a few more amps to, to go through. So suddenly, if I, if I multiply this, um, instead of um, uh, sort of 30 amps, I, I, it takes about 40, 42 amps or even more. Yeah? So, um, so sometimes the, the way to deal with this is that we start the motor in star configuration, and when it's up to speed, we move over to delta configuration, so it doesn't draw quite as much current as it would if we, if we were to, st to start it in delta, but we have still got all the torque. Yeah? So that's one way uh, we deal with, uh, with three-phase motors. Right, uh, what do you need to remember from this long talk? Um, star, low current, because of the coil configuration, delta it takes more current. Starting current on delta is even more, and on star is less. Yeah. So, um, so th that's just something to bear in mind. So what do we do? Delta, we've got more torque. Star, we've got less torque. Um, so in order to get the best of both worlds, we, we start off the motor in star configuration. Once it's running, we switch it over to delta configuration. And um, and then we uh, we've got the best of both worlds, you know, low starting current and high torque once the motor is running. Right, uh, how is it done in real terms? There's either a centrifugal switch which allows the switch over, and it's all done inside the motor, or uh, we've got uh, an external circuit and we use a timer. So we turn on the motor and then we've got a, a timed circuit for a couple of seconds and then a little. Um, contactor goes and uh, switches everything back over to, to delta and then uh, the motor can run with a lot more power. Right, um, so star configuration, we've got a lower starting current. It's possible to connect a neutral to the center but we don't need it. Um, this is a typical configuration of the terminal box where on one side everything is connected horizontally and then you feed in your three phases like uh, L1, L2 and L3 on the other side of the terminal box. That's what it looks like on the inside. So we've got L1, L2, and L3. They're not connected on the outside, and then uh, that's how it works. Uh, we've got less torque. Uh, so the torque is only about 80% of that of the, the same motor running in delta configuration. Okay. Delta configuration, that's what it looks like. So we've got higher torque, higher starting current, only allows for three lives to be connected. And that's fine. And that's the, the way it would look like. So in our terminal box, we would have uh, uh, those little copper plates or brass plates just going through from um, U1 to W2, V1 to U2, and uh, W1 to V2. Uh, so uh, that's a configuration. And now my question to you is, when you go to your company, um, what do you recognize? I mean, do you use most motors in star configuration? Uh, I guess I would say the majority of the motors you've got there are asynchronous motors. And um, and to take one guess even further, I would say most of them probably run in star configuration as SD form. So you don't bother about the 20% extra. Okay, now... Um, Good question from Hayden about the switching over from star to delta. Um, as far as I know, there are some motors where all this happens inside. So you've got some, uh, all the technology sat inside the motor. Uh, normally, it would just be on the outside. So you, you would have wires going to the motor. And um, um, I guess I would say all six connections. And you would just uh, feed them back to a clever clever box. Uh, and in this box, you've got your timer, and you put all the connection, and the, the, the switch over from star to delta would, would happen inside the um, the box, like the panel panel box. Um, we used to, at Wakefield College, we used to have um, um, a motor simulation uh, workshop uh, for three-phase motors, and um, there everything was done in um, inside... Um, um, yeah, I mean, we had like all these units, you would just wire them up and, and sort of try and get it going. You would normally get like um, a ready wired box for the panel and then uh, put your contacts in there. Okay, Ross, thanks for the feedback. Most of you are wired up in star. 
that majority in star, heavier applications use delta, then use a timer to switch to star. Okay, yeah, it's fine. Thanks, Brad, for that. Okay. Uh, right, next one. And uh, now, uh, this is a question Brad was asking earlier. We've got pole pairs on three phase motors. Um, so we've got poles, and um, there's a mouse, the mouse is here. Um, so this would be one pole that would be uh, one winding, you know, going on the opposite. And then this is the second winding, that's the third winding. Follow the mouse. And this would be a single pole motor, yeah, or one pole pair for each phase. That's what it means. So single pole doesn't mean you've just got one winding, but per phase you've only got one winding. So it will run at synchronous speed. That's very important. So if I've got 50 hertz, it will run at 50 revolutions per second or per phase. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to show you what it looks like. This is what it, uh, but we've got two pole pairs. And then the blue one as well, you can see there's uh, the blue one and then the brown one. And they're all sort of um, uh, set apart. It's at 45 degrees. No, it's 90 degrees, isn't it? 90 degrees. They're set apart by 90 degrees. Does it make sense? 60 degrees. Anyway, um, not sure about the degrees. You can, you can work it out yourself. But uh, you can see how this is sort of fitting together. Now, when you've got uh, two coil pairs per face, or two poles per face, or pole pairs, it's sometimes referred to, uh, what happens is that the, the speed, the synchronous speed is going to halve. So that means this one is not going to run at um, 3,000 revolutions per minute, but because we've got two poles per phase, or two pole pairs per phase, it depends on the terminology, uh, you will have uh, a speed of 1,000 RPM, uh, so 1,000 revolutions, sorry, 1,500 1, revolutions per minute, or you will have uh, a speed of 25 revolutions per second. So I got this right, I hope. Yeah, got it right. But, um, okay, that's so you lose on one side, so you lose your speed, the speed is half, but... Um, you gain with the torque, so the torque doubles up. So it's almost like an electronic gearbox, uh, where you gear down and you get less speed but more torque. Um, and that's just done through the pole pair. So another advantage is, um, I mean, not that it makes that much of a difference. Three-phase motors run very smoothly anyway, but they run even more smoothly, you know, the way the uh, pole pairs are set up. Okay, let's take it one step further and go to three pole pairs. Yeah? So uh, this is a single pole pair, now we've got three. And again, if you look, you've got the red one here, then you've got the red one there, and another red one there. Yeah. So per phase, we've now got three windings. And uh, so it always goes, um, you know, red, brown, blue, red, brown, blue, red, brown, blue, and, and so on. It goes all the way around. And you've got like the opposing coils. So these are the pole pairs. And, and again, uh, what do you think is the speed and torque compared to an equivalent single pole pair, a three-phase motor? Leave this to you. Okay, a really complex question from Hayden. I'm going to let you think about this. What do you think is the speed? What do you think happens to the torque? And I'll try and get to the ground with the question from Hayden. Okay. All right, I have to think about this question. It's, uh, I think the answer is yes, but what about magnetizing coils? They shouldn't magnetize anyway, uh, at least not permanently. Um, there's something called uh, permanence um, which has to, to do with this uh, residual magnetism in a coil, yeah, which, which is there. If you've got a copper coil, you demagnetize it. Uh, is it permanence? I think it's permanence, yeah. That's the, the term. There's um, a little bit of residual magnetism left in it, and it's a bit of a problem. Um, so if you've got a material which retains less magnetism, uh, the lesser the magnetism, the better it is. Yeah. And I think copper is fairly good compared to other materials. Iron is pretty bad. Okay, uh, Ryan, triple the torque, 
and third of the speed, but it sounds not PM triple tone. Okay, yeah, spot on. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty much the answer. So that game goes on. So you can have like um, a four pole, pole pairs or six pole pairs and so on. And the speed goes down and down and down the more pole pairs you have. And the torque goes up and up and up. Yeah. And the factor the speed goes down by is the factor the torque will go up by. So if you start off with uh, 100 newton, newton meters and uh, for um, a three pole pair one, you would end up with 300 newton meters. Um, right, so that's one of the calculations about three-phase motors. Uh, so when you read on a, uh, on the data sheet that you've got different pole pairs for a three-phase motor, then this is what happens. And it's important as well. So for example, if you've got a line and the motor goes down and you, you know, Gaffer tells you, uh, get on, order another one, and you go online and you look for an equivalent motor, and the motor you have has got two pole pairs, but the motor you buy has got single pole pairs per phase, um, the speed will not be right. You, know? you will be twice as fast and you will cause all sorts of problems when you stick that motor onto the line. Same the other way around. If it's just got a single pole pair and you buy double pole pair motors because you think they're better, they've got more torque or whatever, um, you've got the same problem that the um, uh, the speed is, is going to be different and so they, they don't work. So you need to really look out for this figure as well for pole pairs. And again, the reason why we are covering this is that, that you understand what it does. So when you order replacement motors uh, and it talks about pole pairs or poles, um, then at least you've got, got a rough idea in the back of your mind what it's, what it's about. Okay. Right, let's uh, move on. Uh, power of a three-phase motor. We are back to box standard Ohm's law. Remember there are three phases. You would have to need to clarify power per phase or total power. So when you've got a kilowatt, you know, one kilowatt motor, which is pretty standard, um, then you divide it by, um, uh, you know, use Ohm's law and then you, you get your result. You can calculate uh, what the current, the likely current draw is for each phase. Okay, um, the next one is just the plates. And um, the first question is, what information can you take from the plate? So I want you to spend a moment to just look at the plate and see what you can identify. And there are a couple of questions, three phase or single phase, single pole or double pole pairs, uh, EU, USA, you know, where where is the motor be made for, for what country, and what is the power rating? Okay, just um, see whether you can come up with some information. What's the time? Two o'clock, okay, should be okay. Um, another 10, 15 minutes and we'll be done. Okay, give us some answers here, what you can take from the plate. Um, Okay, so Ryan Cree, 60 hertz motor, USA. Yeah. <coughs> uh, we've got 35 amps. USA calls it 60 hertz. That's spot on. Yeah. So, what power rating do you think it has when you look at 35 amps? Okay, how did you find out that it's double pole? Just out of interest.
It's it's right, Nick. But how do you how did you work it out? RPM, okay, spot on, spot on. Okay, um, <clears throat> 16 kilowatts, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, let me just go and take you through these, uh, through these uh, plates. And, and this is a typical plate, you will find it on, you should find it on every three-phase motor. Uh, so first of all, you've got the manufacturer here, and you get some very crucial information. We've got a little bit of information here. There tells us that it's a three-phase motor, so we've got three-phase here. But also the voltage here uh, gives us a little bit of an indication that it's, that it's a three-phase motor. So if it's uh, not 230 or 110, but it's 460 or 415 or um, anywhere there, so that's a good indication we've, we've got a three-phase motor. Now, this has been made for the USA. USA has got um, 60 hertz um, as, a, as a supply frequency for their, for their mains. And, uh, and so it, it lets us know that it's, this motor has been made for the US. A quick question, would it work, um, would it work on 50 hertz? Would it work on uh, 50 um, on uh, on 50 hertz this motor yes or no uh, let me just type it in um Okay, um, okay uh, I've got a couple of interesting points here. Uh, Nick says no. Um, Hayden says yes, but you would have to reduce the voltage, wouldn't you? Um, okay. There's an argument around this. I'm, I'm going to go through it in a minute. Any advances on that? Mm, Brett says our um, US or Tobis, it works on both, just different characteristics. So I assume yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's let's go through. The answer is um, is um, yes. I mean, it would work. Yeah? Um, I'm not sure. One of you made made the point that um, uh, you know you, you would have to change your voltage. Uh, you you would have to reduce it. Otherwise, you get too much current through. And there is an element to that. And um, there are two two aspects to that. So number one is. Um, the faster the motor runs, the more back EMF we've got to deal with, um, which reduces the current into the coils, into the windings. Also, um, and I'm not sure how much it would actually be a mathematical exercise to, to work it out, um, how much reactance is there. So using 60 hertz instead of 50 hertz, the reactance of the coils would be higher, which again would reduce the current flow into the coils. So, uh, and I'm not sure whether you're really, and I really would have to sit down to look at the um, the inductance of each winding, you would have to calculate the back EMF you get from the rotation of the rotor, and uh, but there's there's an element of that. So that was well observed. That uh, if as you lower the frequency, the reactance goes down as well, and there would be more current flowing into the coils, and potentially the coils would heat up a little bit more. So how big the effect is, I'm not sure. 
Um, the biggie is that the, the RPM would change as well. So the RPM would go down. So if you put 50 hertz in, it, uh, it wouldn't be 1,700 and, uh, what is it, 65, but it would be some, somewhat less than that. Um, uh, also bear in mind, when you've got a VFD, a VFD works with variable frequencies from 1 hertz to a couple of hundred hertz. So most of these motors, they will work happily within a given range. Yeah? So they could work till about maybe uh, 100, 200, 300 hertz without a problem. Uh, also, you know, lower, you know, they could work with a couple of hertz as well. Uh, but again, it's it's like, uh, it's well observed, um, the less, uh, the lower the frequency, the lower the reactance, the more current would rush into the coils. Um, and, and also when you start the thing off, uh, that will be quite enhanced as well. Um, okay. Um, right. Okay, let's quickly go through the rest of it. So three phase or single phase. So we know it's three phase. We've got the um, the volts here as well, giving us an indication that it's a it's a three phase uh, motor, single polar double pairs, and that's what we can. And this was well observed. That that's what we can work on with the RPM. So if it's running at sixty hertz, the synchronous frequency should be three thousand three three thousand six hundred RPM. And um, and this is uh, 1,765, so it should normally be 1,800, but it's an asynchronous motor, and so it's going to be slipping behind a little bit the synchronous speed. So it never reaches 3,600, or in this instance, it'll never reach 1,800, but it'll always be a little bit slower. Um, EU or USA, so this label has been made for the uh, for the USA. We can see this here by the 60 hertz. So Siemens probably sell the same motor for the European market, and they probably don't even make any changes. Um, probably, I, I don't know, but I assume it's it's not much much difference. And they they would just stick a different label on it, with a lower voltage and uh, lower maximum voltage, and they would call this M50 hertz. And the power rating would be um, very simply: um, you've got the current, you multiply it by the volts, and um, that's right, isn't it? Um, and what do we get? We get uh, 13,000 or something, 16,000. Uh, so that would be the, the thing. So again, uh, when you get these plates, it's worthwhile to look at them. Um, and, and it gives you, before you take the motor apart, you try to see what's inside. It gives you a good idea of what you're dealing with. Okay, we've got another one. What can you tell me about the motor? Um, Okay, um, I leave this to you. Just a um, few answers and how much time have you got? We've got about, uh, let's see, I think we're almost done with this presentation. Yeah, so it's just a couple of slides and we are done. Um, okay, just give me a few points of what you can pick up from this plate and why. Okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, I go along with that. Ryan, how do you work out how many pole pairs there are again? Okay, you just look at the RPM, Ryan. Um, so the synchronous RPM should be should have been three thousand six hundred. So that's uh, sixty times um, the uh, the frequency. So it was sixty hertz. Sixty times sixty is three thousand six hundred, and um, and the the RPM on the motor was given as. 1,700 and I think it was 65 um, and uh, and so we know because it's half there must be uh, two pole pairs in there uh, so if it was three pole pairs it would be 1,200 or below 1,200 uh, okay Right, have a look at this uh, plate. Just give me some information. What what can you tell me when you look at this plate? How should you run the motor or what should you, you know, what's weird about this plate? What can you tell me about it? It's three phase, yeah. Well observed.
Uh, Two-point motorway. Yeah, straight away you can see this, okay? So it says 1,430 RPM uh, per minute. And uh, so normally it should be for 50 hertz, 3,000, so it's less than half. So it must be two pole per motor. Okay, what else can you tell me? Okay, Nick makes, makes a valid point here. So we've got delta and um, and star configuration. Yeah? And you can see we've gotten delta, you should only use 220 volts. And for star configuration, uh, you can use 380 volts. If you've got 60 hertz, you can um, you know bump up the voltage a bit higher. Again, probably the, the whole reactance bit and everything. And... Um, and here we've got the power as well in, in kilowatts. Yeah. Again, why why is it a problem to um, what would happen if I were to put it in delta configuration and I run it at three hundred and eighty volts? Okay, thanks for Nick for the uh, power calculation. So that's a current. So straight away we know what type of uh, wires we would need to use. <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, motor's quite heavy, 55 kilos. So you would need um, a winch to winch it up. Shouldn't be lifting it. Okay, what would happen if you uh, were to use 380 volts in delta configuration? Okay, uh, Hayden, uh, spot on. Okay, the windings would heat up and, and you would... Um, you would probably burn out the motor, so it wouldn't last very long. Current is too high, yeah. Kaboom. Spot on, Brad. Yeah. Um, okay, spot on. Okay, you're getting it. Um, again, when you look at those plates, have a, <clears throat> when you go to work next time, just, um, <coughs> and you've got a spare moment, just have a look at those plates and see what you can tell from those motors. And it's, it's actually quite a lot of information you can take from there. And obviously, when you, if you want to look them up, you've got... Um, even the email address, the web address as well. So it's www.pgr.com.tr. TR, I think, is Turkey. Um, I think. I'm not sure. But anyway. Right. Um, next one. Um, <clears throat> I'll... Um, Send you this in an email. So tell me what you can find out about the this plate. And then <coughs> we've got a bunch of tasks as well. So how many connections could you find in a synchronous motor? What are the main differences between a synchronous and an asynchronous motor? Uh, you read that a three-phase motor operates at 50 hertz at 1,000 RPM. What type of motor is it? Given the choice of what type of motor you would use in a coal mine for a conveyor belt, would it be synchronous or, or asynchronous and why? Which configuration draws more current, star or delta? Uh, which of the two config configurations can generate a higher torque by how many degrees are the phases separate in a three-phase current? <coughs> so that's your homework. So I've got a bit of a cough here. Um, I'm just going to go back between asynchronous and synchronous motor. <coughs> <coughs> um... Okay, so um, starting off, have you got a synchronous? So this is a synchronous motor, asynchronous motor, so in one term. So again, we don't have um, <clears throat> any slip rings. All we have is just a, a bearing and a squirrel cage that is not connected electrically to anything. All it has is a mechanical connection. So that's an asynchronous motor. Yeah. The beauty is there are no sparks, no arcs. There's no electrical connection that moves. <coughs> so we don't have any carbon brushes or anything like that. And uh, when I go to a synchronous motor, so a wound rotor motor, <coughs> we've got a coil. And um, 
um, the rotor is made up of a coil and it's got a DC supply. So DC is put into the rotor and um, <clears throat> and it, um, it is swung round by the orbiting magnetic field. Uh, a wound rotor motor is not a, is not a self starter, so it needs. And we're going to look at this how this is done in the next presentation. How how um, an asynch a synchronous motor, it's difficult asynchronous and a synchronous motor, but how the wound rotor motor, the synchronous motor, is started. So what methods are used to start the thing off? Um, you've got better torque, <clears throat> and you can change something which is called excitation uh, through varying the current into the um, the coil and into the the stator windings yeah, which which go around uh, normally you will find that um, um, motors in in industry which are fairly big and where efficiency is very important they tend to be synchronous motors also motors in uh, electric cars they tend to be synchronous motors and again, we're going to look at this as well, and, and it's to do with um, regenerative braking. And you know, you go down a hill or you slow down, and you don't put any um, current into the rotor. But because you've got a current in the the coils in the windings around it, um, you will actually um, um, generate electricity to put it back into the the battery. And so it's it's very important because very often, you know, like town traffic, you stop and go. So when you brake, before you hit the brake pads, it just uses this regenerative braking to try to put the power back in again. Um, okay, just to sum it up, synchronous motor, not a self-starter. Uh, it's got the, um, the rotor uh, and it's got windings on the rotor and uh, you have to put some DC power into it. So in extreme circumstances, you've got uh, L1, L2, L3. So that's your life wires for synchronous motor. Then you've got your DC supply, which might be whatever in DC and then you might still have a neutral wire and an earth wire so you're looking at about uh, seven wires you would have to connect um, and when you go back to an asynchronous motor uh, just let me go back so that's the squirrel cage induction motor which is asynchronous um, you, all you have is three connections and possibly earth uh, you don't need a neutral wire you can put it in if you choose to do so but it's not really necessary there's no normally no current going into the neutral wire and and all you have is just like your three connections to the three coils the three windings you've got in the in the synchronous in the asynchronous motor there's no connection made to the rotor the rotor just picks up the um, um, electricity through induction from the orbiting magnetic field and then in turn you get some currents going through the uh, through the squirrel cage and as the currents go through, they generate magnetism. That magnetism interacts with the magnetism of the um, of the stator, of the stator coils generated by the stator coils, and it, it turns round. Asynchronous motor is a self-starter, so you don't need any anything to start the thing off, any additional technology or anything. Um, but it'll never hit the synchronous speed. It'll always slip behind the synchronous speed. Um, Right, Brad has got a question. Does synchronous reach 3000 RPM or is it just a synchronous motor set slip? Synchronous reach, a synchronous motor, let me go back to synchronous. A wound rotor motor or a synchronous motor will reach 3000 RPM and will stick there. Yeah. And that's and it'll lock in. Yeah. So And they're very sturdy as well. So to get them out of sync, you have to have a really big load, but they will, they will stick there. An asynchronous motor will always slip behind. Yeah. And, and I mean, what you find is when you uh, look at your conveyor belts and things like that, <clears throat> and if the motors need to run at a certain speed, um, you, you normally have a VFD, which is pretty much standard today. So that's a variable frequency device. So you tune in the VFD to wherever the conveyor belt needs to be. And um, so if you need it at 3000 RPM, then um, with a slip, you might put in 3100 um, um or would it be 50 hertz? You would you would put the frequency a little bit higher. Instead of 50 hertz, you would put it maybe 55 or 56 hertz, and that accounts for the slip, and you would still get it onto onto 3,000 rpm. But they don't lock in. It's just uh, the the way they work. Uh, asynchronous motors they never lock in. Yeah. 
Synchronous motors do, asynchronous don't. Um, okay. Um, with that, we are done for today. I'm going to email you the um, the tasks. Um, please do them. And, and again, when I was going through three or nine for the, and I'm not sure whether uh, you've not been told or, or whatever how to do it, and I'm not 100% sure, to be honest, how to do it either. Uh, when I looked at three or nine, there's a, a lot of you haven't uploaded. Some of you have, some of you haven't. Uh, haven't uploaded your three or nine stuff to, you know, the coursework or what we do on the course to um, to the unit. Yeah? So for 315, whatever you do, if you can, please upload it to uh, to one file. Um, I'm not that good on one file, but I know Vic and uh, Ian are better. So if you've got any questions and you are struggling getting stuff up to one file, feel free to ask them and to pester them um, and uh, get them to coach you through it. But, um, you know, all these worksheets and, and the stuff I'm asking you to do if you can please please upload it to to one file very very important right on that note i um will ask you any more questions on anything you okay with everything uh, let me just type this oops that was wrong On keyboard. <clears throat> yeah, you're welcome. So, um, yeah, I know that's that's what I'm here for, Brett. Uh, pick my brain as much as you want. As long as it works, it's it's uh, there to be picked. So, um, okay. Anyway, I'm gonna send this out to you. I'm gonna email you those tasks uh, plus the the plate, and then um, we'll take it from there. Uh, Charlie, yeah, he's marked the unit up, but your work is not, the last one is not on, uh, I think you've emailed it to me um, a moment ago. Uh, I need to upload it and just make sure everything is okay. So, um, um, so it just needs to be up there, that's all. I haven't seen it, maybe I've missed it or something, I'll have another look. Uh, it just needs to be up there on uh, the 3 or 9. Okay, uh, I'll, um, tomorrow morning we've got the last presentation on the sum summary for 315. And then I've, I'm going to look at the assignment brief in the afternoon. So on that, this, that is us done tomorrow. Friday is bank holiday, so you're off. Okay, Charlie, last one. Did you just upload it now, or did you upload it some time ago? I didn't. I didn't find it, so it might might have been my mistake. Did you just upload it now, or uh, that's the question? Uh, right, it's not a major issue. It's just um, um, I was looking for it. I couldn't find it, so uh, I was hoping that. Um, that it's there. Okay, what's the deadline for this assignment? I don't know. No idea. I have to ask Gary. Um, see what he comes up with. The same as all the rest of it. Okay, Charlie, that's fine. I, I'll, I'll have another look. If it's uploaded, then everything is fine. It's, it's okay. If I can't find it, I think you've just emailed it to me, then I'll upload it for you. And uh, it, should be, it should be okay. So don't worry too much about it. We sort it. Uh, deadline for the assignment, you need to ask Gary. As I mentioned before, if you get it out of the way, it's done. Um, there's a practical element as well. So the theory, obviously, do whenever you can. The practical, if you can do it at work, it would be great. And there still needs to be a write-up. Maybe you've done it already. If you can't do it at work for whatever reason, we will do it at the PMC when you come back. I'm, I'm not sure when that is. That might be uh, in the next academic year. Uh, so uh, we, we'll sort it out somehow. But uh, but whatever you can write up, try and write it up now, and then uh, it's out of the way. You don't have to worry about it. 
okay, I shall end the stream and send you those emails out. And I'll uh, um, yeah, I'll talk to you. Talk to you tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning about ten thirty. Tomorrow morning, yeah, tomorrow morning. It's got to be ten thirty. Uh, I've got a meeting at ten, so we'll meet at ten thirty. Um, for the first one, yeah. For the second one, no. It's just going to be the assignment. Uh, so it's a little bit of a written stuff. Uh, again, um, what I've been asked to do is <clears throat> for, um, and it's all to do with evidence because it's remote learning and all that. And to be fair, the other students had to do, the other classes before you had to do the same thing. Whenever we do a class, you are supposed to take notes and then to upload them. And um, um, it doesn't prove an awful lot if you upload my PowerPoint. Um, which I'm going to make available anyway. But uh, so I've been asked to give you tasks, and those tasks, uh, the results, you know, the answers should be uploaded. And this is evidence that you are going through a process of study. I think that's what it's what it's for, the way I understand it. So uh, that's that's the reason for uploading it to OneFly. Okay. Any more questions? I'm going to wait for about, uh, let me just put the clock up here. I'm going to wait for about uh, half a minute, which should mean the audio comes through. And a bit more. And then I'll end the stream. Um, as I said before, tomorrow at 10.30 in the afternoon, it's going to be about 2 o'clock. And so just looking at the assignment brief and what it's all about and, and what you can do and what you may not be able to do and will do later. And then we officially finished unit 315. Yeah. So, um, um, and then we're going to look at the next units um, and what we'll be doing. Okay, no more questions. I'll uh, end the stream. Obviously, feel free to email me if you have got questions. Let me remind you as well, if you email me with a question, uh, try to email me at the college address, not the other address. I just use it because I can't use attachments on my college webmail. So, um, uh, okay, one more question. Let me just check this. Um, the assignment, okay, what do you have to do for... Um, Oh, that's uh, my cut. Um, <clears throat> don't know whether you could hear her. Uh, for the assignment, what we um, what you have to do is for the practical bit is um, you have to find some errors. Yeah? So when um, if you do it at, at the PMC, uh, I will have a session with you where where I show you what can go wrong with the motor, and um, and then you have to to locate first of all do some diagnostic testing. And to find the find the mistakes, find the errors. So, um, so there could be some on the, um, um, for example, the DOL, the the direct online switch, or there could be you know something with the wiring on the motor, um, something like that. Yeah, you know? or you know the rotor could maybe go the wrong way around and things like that. So I've got a list of about, I think it's about a dozen um, a dozen errors. So I'll show you what the errors are. So you do some testing, and then you tell me what the error is. And I think you don't even have to rectify it. It's just diagnostics. Um, for the other bits, is uh, it's just answering a lot of questions. Yeah. But we're going to go through that on um, Thursday afternoon. Okay. Right, I'll uh, end the stream here. I'll see you tomorrow morning and uh, tomorrow afternoon as well. Have a good afternoon, and um, please, you know, answer those questions. Um, and if you can upload them to one file, um, feel free to email them to me as well. If you struggle to upload them, I can upload them as well. But in the first instance, you give it a go. Um, yeah, we're going to do this on Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon, I'll show you the whole assignment and everything that's in it. Um, the list, it, if you do it at work, it doesn't have to be the list of faults I've got. So if you have got a fault at work, um, anything, you know, if you do some diagnostics, um, which fits in with the, within the assignment, 
um, you can uh, you can do it. Somebody superior to you has to sign you off and to you know give a witness statement that you have done it. But um, but it's it's just some diagnostics applied. That's all. Okay. Good. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow.